We're good. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you for coming to this session. Hope you enjoyed the morning and the keynote. Um, I'm Yosef Durr, and I'm here with Usman Anwar, and we are program managers. And we are passionate about open source. How many of you are using open source libraries and tools uh, in your projects? Fantastic. So we work with engineering teams at Microsoft on integrating open source into Windows and contributing to open source projects that many of us are using to build apps, projects like OpenSSL and CMake. And we're here to share with you some examples and demos of how you can use some new ways that you can use open source when you're building apps for Windows. So let's start. We're going to start with a, an overview of Microsoft and open source. What's going on with the Microsoft culture? What does Microsoft think about open source today? Then we're going to dive into the demos, and we're going to spend most of the time in the demos. And we'll wrap up with what's happening in Visual Studio and how Visual Studio is doing more and more to support developing using open source. Let's start with a question. Does Microsoft embrace open source? Would love to get your feedback on this. This is something that Usman and I are passionate about. How many feel like Microsoft is doing a great job of embracing open source? All right. So, 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 maybe two or so out of, two out of four or three out of four stars, is that? All right, that's great. I mean, we want to get to four. We're working on it. So here's how I would answer that question. That it's changed over time. And I want to roll the clock back to two, start in 2001, and let's review how Microsoft has engaged with the open source community. So what was happening in 2001? Well, there are some major open source projects that were gaining a lot of publicity. You had Apache, Linux, Netscape. And it was a time for Microsoft to decide, how did it want to engage with open source? And this was a rough start for Microsoft. There was a real opportunity here. And it wasn't simple. GPL licensing was a curveball. And it wasn't just a curveball for Microsoft. It was for many companies. But I like baseball. I'm going to use a baseball analogy here. It's baseball season. Microsoft was having a hard time at the plate. Let's move on to 2004. So in 2004, Microsoft made its first contribution to SourceForge with the Wix installer toolkit. And from then on, we see increasing involvement with the open source community. Contributions to Linux and Hadoop and other projects. Consumption, more teams internally are starting to use open source. Publishing, clearly with the .NET Foundation and WinJS, you're seeing more and more Microsoft activity with publishing projects into the open source community and working with, with the community. And redistributing. Azure is a great example of this, where Azure looked at an opportunity to embrace open source. And you know what they did? They did embrace open source. And the result is a much better service for you and a much better business for the company. So now Microsoft's getting hits. So what's different about 2015? So we've had, some, we've had some stars. You've seen these stars. Well, in 2015, the company is adopting open source as a company. It's now cool to walk around campus and talk about open source. We also embrace the philosophy of transparency, collaborating with the larger community. We also embrace the social model. So you have your committers and contributors and users. And that model works fantastic for open source project. It also works internally. So it, some teams are starting to apply this in how they're setting up internally. So if you're in some, some team, Microsoft's a big company, right? If you see a project that you're interested in, you can get involved even though it's not in your core subject area. And we use the open source social model to support that. And best practices. We've had some stars. The companies learn from what the stars have done. And we've created best practices so that other groups who haven't been stars now have a roadmap for how to get there. So this is all in. And this is where Microsoft is at today. And it's fantastic for us who love open source. So let's talk about how's Microsoft been involved lately? 
Well, it's across the board. Game middleware, media services, databases, tools, you name it. Microsoft's been involved. There's a ton of open source projects that you can use today. I'll just touch on a few here. OpenCV. So that's computer vision. It's an open source library you can use for facial recognition and other features like that. And Microsoft engineers have been working with OpenCV so that you can use OpenCV in your apps and publish them to the store. Same thing with Cocos 2DX. It's very popular uh, gaming middleware. And multiple groups in Microsoft are working with Cocos 2DX so that you can have a great experience building Cocos 2DX for Windows and publishing those games in the store. And then Dash.js is a JavaScript library that you can use to add the Dash Adaptive Streaming um, protocol, which is fairly new. So teams in Microsoft have been contributing to the Dash.js project, so you can easily add that Dash player to a web page or a Cordova app. So those are some great examples. The company adoption of open source is also showing up in other ways. So now you can become a Microsoft MVP solely based on open source contributions. So that's fantastic. Another one is let's look at what the IE team is doing. So they have a status site. It's open to everyone. And you can see their backlog. And you can go vote on what you want the IE team to work on next. So when I saw this, it's just fantastic. I love the transparency. And not only that, but you can see W3C status and web platform status. And people in the community are using this as a way to track what's happening across browsers. You can see some of the logos there. So for each feature, you can see what, what the status is with the other browsers. And the IE team put the source for this site up on GitHub. And so anyone in the community, if they see something they want to be, be done better or something's not quite accurate about some certain browser, they can go and make those fixes. And they're doing that. So it's a great example of, of how Microsoft is embracing open source. So back to the question, does Microsoft embrace open source? Yes, absolutely. And we're committed to getting better. We know we have work to do. And part of, part of our goal with Build is to get more of your feedback. We want to learn about what's working well for you and what isn't, and what can we do to help. So Usman and I are going to be around, and we're going to want to have those conversations with you because your feedback will make a big impact on what we work on next. We have engineers and teams that are focused on this. All right, so now Usman's going to dive into the next section. Take it away, Usman. All right, thank you. Thank you, Yosef, for that overview. Uh, and thank you all for coming out to San Francisco and to build. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, presenting before you guys. Thank you very much. So now we're going to talk about open source in Windows 10. Up in Redmond, we're spending a lot of time thinking how you as developers can be more and do more using Windows. And we think that by leveraging open source technology, we can make Windows a more powerful platform for your applications. Around the company, we're saying that we're shipping a new mindset, not just new features and new APIs. And this mindset involves embracing open source at each level in our stack. We're, we're using open source in some of our flagship applications, such as Skype, Cortana, the Photos app, many of the MSN apps that you get uh, out of box. Then we're exposing it in our SDK. All join the Internet of Things software uh, framework is a great example of that. We're going to get into depth with that. And then we are shipping open source in our core mission-critical OS components that run across all the devices in the Windows 10 family, ranging from small IoT devices to the tablet to the Xbox and all the way to HoloLens. So let's look at some of the investments that we have made over the last few months. We're really excited about working closely with SQLite. So we love your code. We know that you love to work with SQLite. There are thousands of apps in our store today that use this library for data access. We want to make it run better on Windows than it ever did before. And for that, we are working very closely with the SQLite architect, Richard Hip. Thanks, Richard, for all your help and his core development team. And our core engineers talk to them on how 
we can evolve SQLite and what changes we can make to the operating system so that when the two come together, you get better performance as a user and a developer. SQLite is also a great way to do local data access in your universal Windows applications. It works great on all the devices in the family, especially resource-constrained devices such as mobile phones and uh, devices that comprise the Internet of Things. For those of you who are coming from the enterprise, from the .NET world, you might, be, you might have used Entity Framework. Uh, so Entity Framework 7 is now going to work with Universal Windows application. And you'll be able to use it with the local database for local storage, which is going to be SQLite. So let's get into our first demo, which is a lightweight to-do list app, which is tightly coupled with SQLite. It's a XAML uh, C++ application. You're on this quickly. Oh, sorry. Like that. It's coming. Over here. Let me fire that up. You see the emulator just fine? Actually, I should. 's here all right so here I have a simple to-do list app it has basic categories for different type of tasks I have work personal family uh, and I'll go start adding some tasks so as a program manager I have to re reply to a lot of emails that I haven't in a while since I'm here so I'll reply to a lot of emails I'm gonna go ahead and add another task uh, right actually finish, I've already started writing it, finish the specs. Uh, and then I'm gonna code up another demo. So I have some work tasks here. Now, in preparation of this talk, I haven't really cleaned up my apartment in a while, so I'm gonna go add a personal task. So apartment cleanup operation. Really needs that. So yeah, so now I've added tasks to each of my categories. And this is basically just storing it in a local SQLite database according to these categories. I can, after I'm done with my work day, I can go get rid of all of these here so they're gone. And I can view the rest in, in the all category. So it's a fairly simple to-do list app. And, and now we're gonna, we can start stepping through the code and see how it works with SQLite. I'm going to start this off with the debugger real quick. I'll launch it with the debugger. So on launching here, I'm just calling the, let me uh, resize this so you can actually see what's going on on the side. So emulator keeps hiding. So yeah, so on launching, I'm just calling SQLite open, which if there's a SQLite database file already sitting on your, in your app's local data folder, it will just open that, or it will go uh, create a new one. Since we're opening this for the first time, it's gonna, I have this creative function. Let's see what's going on in there. So in this creative function, once you create a SQLite uh, file, it doesn't have a table. So here I'm just defining that table. I'm preparing, I'm using a create statement here, uh, giving it the columns that I need in my table. Then I perform a SQLite prepare on it, which turns the SQL statement into a bytecode. I do SQLite step, which makes sure that it's the right SQL statement. It's valid, 
and then it calls SQLite finalize, and it goes and creates my table. And then I basically just call this ref refresh, refresh list function, which just reads data from the table so it can display that. Right now it's an empty table, so you don't see anything. So now let's go and add a task and see what happens. So when I click on work, it's refreshing the list, but now it's telling SQLite that it wants uh, data just for the work category, which is represented by an integer here, which we pass through in, the, in a SQL statement. Work, let's add a task. Uh, Write another demo. So I did write another demo. I tapped the add button. It took me here, where I'm just calling an add item function. Let's see what's in there. I'm in this function. I'm just I just have an insert into the SQLite database for this particular category, which is work. And then I refresh the list again to get fresh data from the database. And I've just store, I just stored right another demo in there so you can see that. So it's, a fairly, it's fairly easy to use SQLite in universal Windows applications from a, from a C++ app. If you, if you will be hacking around with, the, with, with SQLite later on, you'll be getting a lot of requests for that. You can download the V6 for the universal Windows application from the SQLite website uh, and get going. Cool. So let's uh, switch back to the presentation. I got it. So that was a simple, uh, lightweight to-do list demo for the based on SQLite. And now let's talk about how we're using SQLite to do local data access in the operating system. We are storing all of Windows 10 state data in a SQLite database. So up to Windows 8, we had multiple data stores across our, all the devices that we supported and multiple database technologies uh, on the same device. And our engineers moving forward when we were creating a converged operating system wanted a single data store that performed well and was easier to, uh, to, uh, to maintain. So they, they looked at all the technologies we were already using, but they also looked at open source options, options outside of Microsoft. And they, evaluate, and they also evaluated SQLite. And in the performance testing, we found that SQLite actually performed great for the read-heavy scenarios that our uh, state, ga state guys were looking for. So we adopted that. Uh, and we're shipping that on all the devices. And then we took a step back. And we, like, we, we realized, we did a scan of the Windows code base, and we realized that there are other teams that, you know, they want to use SQLite as well. So we were like, all right, let's, why not just collectivize this effort? And we come up with some central processes and policies uh, to manage SQLite in the operating system so it's easier for teams that are consuming it or want to consume it in the operating system to, uh, to onboard it. So right now, if you want to use uh, open source software in an OS component, you have to go through legal and you have to do a bunch of stuff, like IP scanning. So we just centralized that so, it's, so all they have to do is go and declare a dependency on a file. So... Uh, and we are also working closely with the SQLite core developers to see how this can work, uh, be, uh, how the library can work better under the hood. So we've delved into, de into a fair bit of detail. Now let's start talking about abstraction. When it comes to abstraction, a lot of you might like ORMs. Uh, and Entity Framework 7 is our preferred ORM for the universal Windows application platform right now. Uh, so let's, let's take a look into this. Uh, some people like to talk to their databases directly, write code for that, which is fine. Uh, if you're using an ORM, it can help you abstract away uh, a lot of the details so you can focus on uh, the business logic and the user experience. So especially for LOB apps, I, I, when I'm writing my demos, I prefer to use that. So here I have a simple, let me see if I'm on the right one. Fire up, fire up. Cool. So here, here I have a, a universal Windows application. Uh, 
it's for a shipping company. It's, 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 it's for, the, uh, for warehouse employees at a, at a retail store. And what they can do using this is they can go and fetch pending orders from their company's cloud. Then they can assign those orders to themselves if they think they can fulfill it. Uh, I think we can fulfill this, two orange t-shirts. Uh, I'm wearing one right now. So. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So let's, let's do this. So I've assigned it to myself. It has updated that state that this is assigned to me in the, in, in the cloud. And now I'm going to go around the warehouse uh, packaging this order. But I'm going to go offline, because uh, I'll be running around. I'm in nooks and crannies. So I've, I'll have spotty internet connection. So I've turned my inter internet connection off. But all this, the, the order that I assigned to myself is stored locally now. So I'm going to go open this order. I'm going around. Oops. I forgot to. Let's disable all the breakpoints here. Sorry about that. Where is that? Yeah. So I've packed both of these, so I checked them off. I've packed them. And I marked this order as shipped. Ask for a confirmation. But now it tells me that it cannot be marked shipped in the cloud because I'm not connected to the internet and that I should press the sync button when I'm back online. So now I don't have any orders anymore, but I need to still uh, let the cloud know that I've taken care of this. So I'm going to connect back to the internet. And I'm going to go sync this. And now it has updated that state in the cloud. So my order is shipped, and it's marked shipped. Nice. I'm done here. I can do choose orders again. Now I just have one order. No new order came in. Less work for me. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so let's step through this code, and I'll show you how simple it is to do this with Entity Framework and SQLite. I'm going to turn my breakpoints on. Breakpoints. Uh, So the first thing that I'm doing in here, in, inside the code, uh, if you're using Entity Framework, you probably have well-defined models. So I, I create two, two models here. I create the order model. That's it's basically, I have two classes for them. Uh, you can see what's in the order model right over here. Uh, it, is, it has a Boolean of whether it's shipped or not, or whether that shipment is synced with the cloud or not, with some other information. And this maps exactly to the JSON object that I get from the cloud. Uh, so I take the JSON object, serialize it into an object, uh, into an instance of this. Uh, I have a list of items, which I call the order lines. So the shirts, the, uh, the details, the stuff that's required for, for that particular order, it's all mentioned in there. So I have an, and then I have an order line model, whether that order is packed or not. So when we were like clicking, clicking that it's packed or not, it was basically just checking this particular property. Uh, then I have a very simple context where I tell Entity Framework that these are the two entities, the order and the order lines, that I need a data store for. And then here is, uh, is the cool part of this, where I am, basically I am uh, creating a local database in my local folder for my application data. And I'm telling uh, Entity Framework here to use SQLite. And I'm passing it the, the path to where I want it. And this is the only way in the code where you would see a reference to SQLite. So it's abstra it abstracts everything away. Uh, so let's see what happens when you actually go and fill an order. So when you go and fill an order and you, and you click, uh, click on one of the, one of the items, uh, it changes that state immediately to the database. And then 
uh, it checks if all the items have been packed so that it can let the order ship. If they're all packed and I click the ship button, it would ask me to confirm the shipment. And at the same time, when I would confirm it, it would save that state to the database. Then it would try to contact the, the cloud. Uh, yeah, so if it's true. And if it goes through, this should call. So yeah, so here it's just marking the order. Synced as true if it, if it actually hears back from the cloud and it's successfully able to save that. Cool. Yeah. So let me show you the sync logic. I think that was messing that up. Yeah, so, so here's the sync logic where it tries to contact the unicorn store service uh, if the order that I'm trying to sync uh, is actually shipped and it can contact the cloud, it will update that in the database or else it would just show me a dialog that it could not connect and that I should try to sync later. So that's a very lightweight uh, demo of how you can use Entity Framework. This would be online. Uh, Rowan Miller is also giving a more detailed talk on Entity Framework, so you guys should check it out. Uh, it's on Thursday. So now. So there's more to Entity Framework 7. How many of you are involved in an open source project, are managing an open source project, or want to start an open source project? All right, so some of you do. So there's some good lessons that we can take away from Entity Framework. Entity Framework has been fully open source for a while. They're building Entity Framework 7 on GitHub, so you can go see their source. More than that, they are publishing all of their uh, they're consuming open source themselves, and they're publishing all of their engineering notes, their design documents, their meeting notes on GitHub, so people can see uh, what's going in to the framework and why it's going in. And they have a rising number of uh, contributors, and the community around it is growing with people are going in, they're, fi they're, fi they're finding bugs, uh, they're making new design suggestions. And through these meeting notes, they can see where their design suggestions went. And the high-level takeaway from that team, we were talking to those folks uh, a few weeks earlier, was that, hey, if you are transparent with your open source project, you can really build a community around it. And it helps you develop a better product as you're building it. So let's shift gears and talk about the Internet of Things. Now, this is a partnership I'm really excited about. Uh, so all join, as we mentioned before, is a software framework to talk to connected devices. Uh, Microsoft is shipping this as part of the SDK. And Microsoft also sits, uh, has, uh, is also part of the All Scene Alliance, which is a consortium of, all the, of, of many appliance manufacturers and software companies that are working on all joints, specifically like LG, Electrolux, Sharp. Those guys are making appliances. Uh, they already have some in the market. They're making more that, that will be all joint enabled. And Windows did a fair amount of work on, on this front. Uh, our, are all join and the all join team engineers, they work on their core development groups, so they're defining their core frameworks. Uh, our security team uh, spent a fair amount of work security testing all join and defining this, the design for that, and they've contributed that work back to the community. So, all join is a great way to make connected apps uh, on the universal using the universal uh, platform. You can make apps that can talk to an LG WebOS TV, to LifeX bulbs, or you can make your own device uh, using a Raspberry Pi and then make it talk to your app. To your app. It also comes, since it's part of the uh, SDK, you can also use, it, it's better supported in Visual Studio and there's some tooling for it. Demo time? Yeah, let's, let's do the demo. So I'm gonna, quickly demo like the all joint concept here of how you can make a universal Windows application that talks to an all joint enabled device. Yeah. 
So here I have an application that I will use to control my toaster, which is all joint enable. I'm going to quickly go fire up the toaster as well. So we have it somewhere here. Toaster device right over here. And now, so, so I am representing the toaster device by this, by this app that I have over here. You could deploy it on, on a Raspberry Pi and it could work elsewhere. But essentially, these are two separate applications uh, all connected to each other over, over the all join network that both have joined when I launched them. So I can do start toasting here. And then, say, when the toast is done, someone would trigger the toast done signal. And then I get a notification in my notification center, just like I would get a notification from my email that my toast is done. So let's quickly step through the code for this. Um, I'm not going to go too much into depth, because we have an all joint session going on in parallel. You should uh, catch that uh, online, where they will get, get into the details of the architecture. But well, basically here, I have my device is represented by an all joint producer. Like I call, they call it the producer because it's producing the, uh, the notification. And then it simply registers to, to the all joint network using an all joint bus. And it starts off its all joint service. So it starts to broadcast itself that, hey, I'm available. I can talk to uh, other apps. And the cool thing to note here is that you don't have to install any additional library to do this work. You can just start using this namespace, windows.devices.alljoin, and you're good to go. Then on my app side, So on my app side, I'm basically starting a toaster watcher, which would look for this particular device on the network. When I launch my app, the, the watchers are added. Then I launch my all joint toaster device, and it, it says something. It says, hey, I'm available to connect, uh, which fires off this toaster watcher added, added event. And then it can start receiving signals here. Cool. So, it's all running off the all join infrastructure uh, over a Wi-Fi network that both are registered to. So yeah, that's that's so, our simple. So Usman, problem. that's that's a cool demo. But thank you. You know, I think there's another cool way we can show all join working, and I think I think you know mm. what I'm talking about. It's yeah. uh, it's your yeah. your alpha Kinda. project, your torch. Yeah. So let's 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 show them the torch. Let's show them the torch. Yeah. It's not quite done yet. We're working on it. So I want a torch that I can carry around at my house parties, and so that I can sync the lights on the torch <laughs> to my music that I'm playing That's through right. my all joint speakers. That's right. So we got this torch app. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's yeah, do some so, stuff. Can so you what's going on is this is running on my laptop, and it's talking to this router. And the bulb is also talking to this router. So it's an all joint network right here on stage. So that's just a power cord. Yeah, and, it's um, basically just a lamp that I didn't fully assemble, so we can right. all go so, make one. So this is a Windows app, and uh, we've got a, a few things we can, uh, let's see, is it working? No, it's not working. Hold on. OK, maybe we'll have to come back to that demo. Mm -hmm. It is an alpha. It does work. Hold on a second. Let me shut it down, launch it again. Yeah, let's just try one more time. Let's see. I want to make sure I can see it. Am I on? Oh, there's my problem. Oh, you're not. So we I weren't got, connected to our I got home Wi Fi. The so uh, we connect to our home Wi Fi. Do you need a password? For yes, that? I want to. So this is a tool that basically when it, 
it sees other all joined devices available, it just spits it out on the command line. All right, hopefully that works. Let's see if we can see the device. So, oops. Dang, it's not working. Okay. Yeah. Let me do the other demo, and if we can well, figure out we what that was, back we'll come back to it. Anyway, it's work. It's cool. It does work, but we are on the we are on the bleeding edge here. All right. So now I'm going to do the next demo. And uh, let's start with a scenario. So let's say you want to build a media player. And you want to support a broad range of codecs. And the first place to start is you look at the Windows Media Pipeline and the platform support for media. And they've done a ton of great work there. There's another session on all the stuff they've been doing. And you get a lot of great features. You get your audio and video syncing and uh, the hardware decoders, so like especially on mobile, it's not going to drain the battery nearly as fast as software decoders. And so you, you're looking at that, and there's a lot of great popular codecs that are supported there. But in your app, you want, you want broader support for different codecs. And so in the open source world, there's FFmpeg. And FFmpeg is a great open source library. And the team I'm working with took a look at FFmpeg and, and, and said, well, how, how can we make it easier to use FFmpeg in your apps? And at the same time, how can you leverage in that same app the Windows Media Pipeline? So what they came up with is FFmpeg Interop. And this is up on GitHub now. And you can come join us, make it better, where it's actively being worked on. And let me show you how it works. Here we are. All right. So here's the app. Simple app. I'm going to pick a local file. Play some creative, uh, creative Commons content. This big buck bunny. You guys have probably seen this if you're working with media. OK, so there it's just playing the app. Let me show you the code. So here's our open local file. All this code is doing is opening a file picker. It's identifying the, the file you want to play. It creates a file stream to that. It passes that file stream into FFmpeg Interop, the library. What you get back from FFmpeg Interop is a media stream source. And that's a generic class that you can use to represent media for the Windows Media Pipeline. You can assign that media stream source to a media element in your XAML. So it's just a few lines of code, and you've got a media player. Let me show you a little more. Let's step in into the debugger this time. I'm going to play that same clip, and you can just see the code. All right, so here now we're, in the, we're inside FFmpeg Interop. And the idea is that. When you're using FFmpeg Interrupt, you don't need to touch this code. It's just going to do the right thing for you. I just want to show you what it's doing. So here it's unpacked that file we gave it. It's unpacked the container, and it's found an audio stream. And it's just going to look at what's the codec. And it sees that it's AAC. And it knows that our media platform has support for AAC, so it's not going to decompress it. Same with the video stream. It sees it's H.264. And it says, I'm going to leave this compressed, and I'm going to let the Windows Media Pipeline handle this content. It all comes back as a media stream source and gets assigned to that media element. And you've got playback. Now, broad codec support. I'm going to open a .og file. This you cannot just click in File Explorer and play in, in Windows. Same code. It's going to look at the codec, and it's going to see that it's Vorbis. And it'll say, no, I, I'm going to have to decompress that with software, the software decoders. So it does that. And same thing with the video. The 
codec is Theora. And it's going to use, it's going to create uncompressed with the software decoders. But for the user of this library, it's the same code. You're applying the resulting media stream source to that, that media element, and you get playback. So very cool. And I think this is a great example of Microsoft engineers being creative about how you can use the best in the Windows platform and leverage open source in your projects in a simple way. We're still working on this. We'd love to have people that are interested in this project to get involved. It's up on GitHub now. All right, so that's it for our demos. And I'm bummed about the lamp. We're going to have to set up the lamp somewhere yeah, and just show yeah, them working, because it works. We've been... Maybe we anyway, can try it out. If you want to help us make the lamp better, make a cool torch. You know? So one of the parties going, you know, it can flash green when, you're, when your phone's ringing. You can't hear your phone. Some great ideas, right? All right. Um, let's flip back to the deck. Visual Studio. Your favorite IDE supporting more of the project types that you love. So Visual Studio has always been my favorite IDE. Are, do you guys feel the same way about Visual Studio? It's just a fantastic IDE, right? And, but sometimes you've had projects in the past, perhaps, where you're using a language or a particular project, and you're like, well, I, I have to use this other thing over here. But wouldn't it be great if you could just stay in Visual Studio all the time? Well, that's what they're working on. So let's give you some examples. GitHub. You're going to be able to work in Visual Studio and never leave the IDE and manage your GitHub projects. It's awesome, right? So there are a couple open source projects that are behind this. And they're libgit2 and libgit 2 sharp. And these are up on GitHub. Check them out. And the great story here is that it's Microsoft engineers working with GitHub engineers and the community all to pull this together in a great way. So definitely check this out. Cordova, if you're interested or, or doing Cordova app development, Visual Studio is now bundling more and more of the dependencies that you need with Cordova. And you can see some big ones in there. Node is in the installer now. And Android SDK is pretty cool. So Cordova, if you're not familiar, is you're using web languages to build apps. So it's HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And it gets packaged into an app that you can, just, you can um, uh, publish on our store. Python. So Hanselman has an article on this about how this particular tool is, is fantastic. If you're if working with Python, it's on GitHub, Microsoft PTVS. And this is actively, continually being worked on, but it's already great. So you get IntelliSense. You get syntax highlighting. You can step through it all within Visual Studio. So definitely check that out. And Node.js in Visual Studio. When I saw this, I got so excited, because I use Node my, uh, on, my, on my own. I love Node. Um, but the thought of staying in Visual Studio and setting breakpoints, and even with remote servers that you're interacting with, there's a lot on the screen there. I'll just let you kind of digest that. If you're big on Node, this is, this is just fantastic. So those are some great examples of how uh, Visual Studio is doing more. That, and uh, you know, it's, just, it's just great to see. All right, so now Usman's going to do the, the summary. Go ahead, Usman. Right. Thanks, Yusuf. So we've talked about like, new tooling in Visual Studio that's available. We've talked about, uh, can you switch? Oh, yeah. There you go. What are you hitting? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh. There you go. Yeah. Very good. And we have shown you what open source we are supporting better on Windows and what's available in the SDK. So now, what are the takeaways? What's in it for you as a developer? First, you can ship your apps faster. You can get to the market, market faster. You have, for some of the cutting edge open source, we have Windows APIs for all join, so you don't need to go worry about onboarding an open source project into your enterprise app, for say, like go around, figure out the licensing and all of that. So we've taken some of that overhead away by providing Windows APIs for some of these. 
they're integrated into the SDK, so again, easier to take a dependency on. Uh, they're easier to maintain now because now for a lot of these, you're going to be getting updates from Windows. You don't need to separately go and update the, the, uh, uh, the libraries that you've packaged in your app. Uh, they're easier to troubleshoot. So you already have this open source community and forums, but now you can also get support from the Windows Development Center, and we would have samples mm -hmm. there for you guys. And it's easier to develop cross-platform apps with, with open source. So say you're coming to, uh, you're, you're, you want to make a universal Windows application, you're coming from a different platform, you don't need to re-architect your entire app because a certain database library isn't available, or doesn't work as well. You can also de deliver better user experiences. So in the all join example that we saw, you saw a notification come in when your toast was done. So because it's all supported by the platform, not only is it more performant, but it, it comes with like less permissions. It's a smoother uh, user experience. There's, it's a smoother flow. You don't have to check a button being like, yeah, let this bulb talk to me. It's all handled by your code. And then because it's supported inside uh, the operating system, we've done special work to keep the memory footprint low and to make it faster. So this is a big. But this was like a big overview of all the different projects we've been working on. There are deep dives happening throughout Build. I encourage you to check them out. Uh, there's a deeper dive into Entity Framework. The all-join session already happened. You can catch it online. Uh, there's one on Angle. The Node.js one I'm really excited about. Uh, do check that out as well. So here's a list of, uh, of talks. And then please do follow up with us. We will be hanging around in the Quick Start Challenges booth. There's a question and answer round right after this. We really want your feedback. Uh, if you have ideas on how we can do this better, yeah, uh, come, come talk to us. If you have complaints, get them off your chest. We are here for you guys. Yep. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of, rest of Build. And I hope we could show you the staff working. But anyways, yeah, there's, there's stuff happens. Thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank you.